I was sitting in my office. The phone rang. When I answered, a female voice said, this is Mary Batts. She wanted to know if she had reached the right place. This was two years ago. And I learned in the conversation and subsequent to that, uh, that she and her husband Gregory were members of a large Baptist church uh, not far from New Orleans. Some of you may know, most of you wouldn't know that when Eve and I were first married, we went to uh, Nashville, actually the locals say Nashville, where I taught for a year and we fell in love with the people from the South. Uh, gracious, friendly, y'all come see us now here. And uh, the students, I loved the students. They were of the same nature. They had been taught to be respectful. Everything was yes, sir, yes, ma'am, and so forth. And uh, when we left just a year later, it's not what we intended to do. I was ready to stay there for the rest of my life. But uh, we ended up back just a year later at Upper Columbia Academy. And believe it or not, uh, <laughs> Neva and I have been around long enough that in those days, you still spoke to an operator once in a while on the telephone. And whenever it would be somebody from the South, I'd, usually a female, I'd say, talk to me some more, I love your accent. <laughs> so Mary had that Southern accent. She and her husband were members of a large Baptist church in Lafayette. And they had gone to a Seventh-day Adventist cooking class because they were both overweight and poor health and had diabetes. And she was inquiring of me if they could come to one of our sessions. Most of you know that we hold these six-day programs on our property. So Mary and Gregory ended up with us for a week. We fell in love with them and within several months uh, they had arranged for us to come to uh, Louisiana and hold classes in a local Seventh-day Adventist church where they had been attending occasionally. And then at their church, large, it's amazing folks, the campus in the South, and all of you have met people and have friends uh, that you've sensed are in that category. I've told you the story before how much I enjoyed the 60 evangelical pastors that I was part of as uh, a ministerial group, where in the beginning they didn't want an Adventist to be members of their organization. <laughs> But they accepted me in the end, and um, oh, I could tell you endless stories. Wonderful Christian men, precious Christian men. And I told you recently, one of them said to me, I, I felt like I, was, I needed to be a pastor to these men. And so I was visiting them. And one of them said to me in one of our visits, and I didn't elicit this, he said, Jim, all of us know, referring to the 60 men, all of us know that Saturday is the Sabbath. <clears throat> I pray for those men almost every day. And I think, uh, I tell the Lord, I would be so pleased, I would just be thrilled if every one of those men, even the fellow that attacked me so much when I first asked to be a member of the group, it's an interesting story. He's the one that said, I know you Adventists, I've read both of your books. <laughs> I didn't say a word, friends. Before he died, I was with him in the hospital and prayed together. But while Mary and uh, Gregory were with us, we had precious worships every morning, prayed together, walked together, talked together, ate together for a week. And my heart was stirred. It's a battle for them. 
whenever someone becomes interested, folks, in the truth, the enemy has a battle for them. They earn their living selling what they call snowballs. You and I would call it a oh, snow cone, perhaps. They have about 100 different flavors or toppings, and they do very, very well. We've been, we have stood inside that trailer, they now have two of them, as the cars line up, they kind of live out of town a bit, and the cars line up out there on the road waiting for their turn to come get their snowball. The problem is their biggest day is guess what? Sabbath. We talked about it with them. She said, we've thought a lot about that. The Lord knows. You never know, folks. It may be that for the time being, their presence in that church may be important. And as I say, she's planning to have us back there along with the pastor fairly soon. We don't know just when at this point in time. But it led my mind during the week with us to the story from John chapter 4, which you and I have studied together, I don't know, it must be 10 years ago from this pulpit. And it's a very familiar story. But I want to look at it again this morning with this emphasis. I want to picture myself, and you might want to do the same, as one of the disciples. And I want you to process with me Jesus work, his method, his effort at trying to help these well-meaning, trainees, who every one of them, except for John, gave their lives in an effort to spread the gospel. And of course, John was exiled, which could have been a fate worse than death. We don't know how he even survived there. We don't know that anybody gave him anything to eat. But there he was, exiled. So pray for that emphasis, if you will, as we reconsider that familiar story. Now let me give you a little context. The Israelites arrived in the land of Canaan about 1250 years BC. After 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and uh, though they paused briefly on the east side of Jordan and did some spying, well that was earlier, but they were back at the Jordan. And when they crossed the Jordan, they went straight to Shechem. You know Shechem, the place where uh, Joseph first went to look for his brothers. And Shechem is about 30 miles north of Jerusalem, between two mountains. You know, probably, you're familiar with this story, Mount Ebal on the north and Mount Gerizim on the south of a little plain in the middle of which was Shechem. Mountains are about uh, just under 3,000 feet above the ground, one of them a little lower than the other. And in Deuteronomy 28, God commands the people to go to these two mountains. He specified six tribes that would be on Ebal, all the people, and six tribes that would be on Gerizim to the south. And Ebal, was the Mount of Cursings. 
And they were to build an altar and cover the stones of the altar with white plaster. And it says in Deuteronomy 28 that they were to write all the words of this law. Apparently, it was the entire sermon found in Deuteronomy that were written on those white covered stones. By the way, I didn't know this. You'd think the person would when we were in India and decided to visit the Taj Mahal. The entire Koran, did you know this, is engraved on the outside of that building. Made me kind of want to just go away, actually. Um, Now, the Bible in Deuteronomy 28 doesn't say that they did the same thing on Gerizim, but it's implied that uh, they were also to build an altar and write all the words of this law. So if you can picture all the people, six tribes one, six tribes the other, and these six tribes on Ebal were to say out loud the cursings that would come from disobedience. They're listed there. And apparently it was antiphonal. Some cursings read, some blessings read, or repeated. And this whole thing uh, was an effort, of course, by God to impress the people. By the way, this is a sidetrack. Even though I chose the hymn, when you were singing it this morning, my heart just was thrilled. Was that for you too? When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Now it happens that, um, so that was about 1250 years BC. Uh, then the Israelites began to move to their places. You know, they had each area, the, the areas were assigned where they would have uh, their land. And um, after David was king and Solomon was king, and then Solomon's son caused the problems that he did. Uh, you all, I think, know this. There may be a visitor or two that's not familiar with the fact that um, 10 of the tribes rebelled under this explanation from the new king, Jeroboam, that there would be much more taxes and much harder uh, governance. And so these ten tribes, um, all except Judah and Benjamin, uh, moved north uh, up uh, near Shechem and, and north of there. Galilee is 80 miles from Jerusalem. Shechem is 30. And so up in that area is where these ten tribes were. And they became known as the as Israel. I think you all know that. And uh, they apostatized very quickly, as you probably know. And only about 500 years later, um, God allowed the Assyrians to completely destroy, if you will, the Israelite people and also the city of Shechem, where many Israelites lived. Interestingly enough, the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh somehow largely were spared from that. And the descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh intermarried and became the Samaritans, who ended up, by the time that Christ was here, in a little town, Uh, not far from where the ruins of Shechem were. Jacob had purchased a little piece of land uh, just west of that. By the way, this whole area right now is in the West Bank, which Israel has, you know, taken over, but it really was part of Palestine. And uh, Jacob had purchased this little piece of land and dug a well. I don't know how many of you have ever been involved in a dug well. Uh, The one at our property is 20 feet deep, and that's pretty deep. Jacob's well was 130, almost 130 feet deep, a dug well. And uh, is there to this day. 
actually a, a city by the name of Nablus. Uh, sort of surrounds Jacob's well. It did not exist in the time of Christ. The city of Samaria, which, Samaria, which was a little further east and closer to where Shechem had been, uh, and the well was outside of that city. We don't know how far, maybe, maybe something like a half a mile or so. But there was Jacob's well. By the way, um, the uh, Samaritan people about uh, 150 years before Christ, before, before, B B B.C., built a temple on Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessings. And about uh, 100 years B.C., a Jewish priest led a small army and destroyed that temple. And when Jesus was at the well with the disciples, if you can picture this now with this kind of this background, you could look, if you were facing Samaria, you could look to your left and see Mount Ebal, not far away at all, or look to your right to the south and see Mount Gerizim. Now, if you uh, care to open your Bible, I would like you to do this to John chapter 4. Although it's very familiar to you. Uh, verse 1, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Verse 3, he left Judea. I didn't mention this in case somebody is not that familiar. So the Israelite kingdom was in the north, about 30 miles from Jerusalem. And the two tribes that were left, Judah and Benjamin, formed what is, what is known in the Bible as the kingdom of Judah in and around Jerusalem. And it says here, Jesus, verse 3, left Judea and departed to Galilee. But, and I think I've told you many times, I wish you'd all just keep this in mind, whenever you see the word and or but in the New, in the New Testament, it's the same Greek word. And oftentimes the translators don't get the sense of the text. It should read, he left, so you can translate this Greek word either way. He left Judea and departed against, uh, again unto Galilee, but he must needs go through Samaria. In other words, the Holy Spirit told Jesus not to take a straight line up to Galilee, but to go east and end up passing through Samaria. Now, folks, again, for myself, and I want you to engage with me in this. Uh, I shared with you months, a couple of months ago a message about the fact that Jesus wants to make me and he wants to make you an evangelist. Amen? Amen. Please talk to me, folks. Amen? Amen. That's his business. And uh, I haven't let him do a very good job with me. Um, and I want you, along with me this morning, to look at this story to see how he was working with these 12 men who, uh, really, folks, didn't get it. Are you all with me? And Buck just said like us, I, I wouldn't have said that to you, but, but you all y'all with me, aren't you? Aren't we in great need, folks, to have happened to us what Jesus, and as you read the stories, they were awfully dull, but what he finally accomplished in them to the point where they were happy to give up their lives for the sake of preaching the gospel. He must needs go through Samaria. I wonder, folks, if every day God wouldn't like to say to me, I must need to have you go here or go there. 
I want to hear that voice or sense what, however God wants to do it. I wish he would just tell me, wouldn't you like that? I think, folks, that there may be several reasons by the, why he doesn't. Um, it's interesting that Jesus said, you know this. I don't even speak my own words. What did he say? I just speak the words the Father gives me. I don't think Jesus heard those out loud. I think he heard those, we say, in his heart. Maybe they came to him from the scriptures in a certain sense. But one of the, thing, one of the things the Lord wants from me and from you, I know you'd agree with this, he wants me to learn how to speak words in season. Isaiah 50, verse 4. If you read that again, you'll see that it's Jesus' prayer in Isaiah 50 where, he, where, Jesus, where, uh, uh, he, uh, where David, wrote, uh, David wrote, the Lord has given me the tongue of the learned that I might know how to speak words in season to him that is weary. Folks, the people around us are weary, amen? They may not know it. They're weary. And Jesus, in his incredible patience, is trying to help. I shouldn't say trying. Is helping these men. He's not trying, folks, because was Jesus successful with at least the 11? Yes, he was. And, of course, the 12th joined him, so we can speak of the 12 in that sense. <clears throat> Verse 5. He comes to a city of Samaria called Sychar near the parcel that Jacob gave to his son. Jacob's well was there, verse 6. Jesus was tired. Do you know, folks, they, I, I, can't, I can hardly imagine they had walked the 30 miles, but that's how far it is from Jerusalem to this well. You can, you can, you can ask Google, and Google knows how far it is from Jerusalem to Jacob's well. But at least 20 miles. So he was tired. He was weary. He was a human being. Now I want you to notice something. Jesus sends the 12 disciples on an errand. The Bible doesn't say this. I think I understand why. Had they been there, Jesus could not have reached the woman. Because one or two men could have gone and obtain the items for their food. But he sent the 12. Sometimes, friends, Jesus sends you and me on a side trip because we're not ready to hear him. We're not ready to receive what he would like to give us. It's interesting to me that the Holy Spirit didn't say to Jesus somehow, now, you know, the disciples are going to mess up this situation I'm going to bring to you. But if you will say this and this and this and this to them, they won't mess it up. Are you following what I'm trying to describe? Mm -hmm. um, the Holy Spirit knew, listen to this, friends. And I'm, I'm applying this to me. I want, I want you each to do that if you're open to it this morning. Um, the disciples weren't even ready to hear that. Are you with me? If Jesus would have tried to explain to them. We do this in, in classes where, you know, we, get the, we tell the people every Sabbath afternoon we're going to ha have a class on how to have Bible studies and how to reach people. And we try to explain to people the kinds of things that they should say or shouldn't say and all of this work that we have with people. But sometimes, even if we were told, we don't quite get it. Does that make sense? So Jesus wasn't led to do that. He just said, go get the food. In the meantime, of course, the woman arrives. And by the way, you may remember me having referred to this. I don't know. Um, would you agree with me that that woman was ready for harvest? Ready to be harvested? And is it true 
that these 12 men were in school, as it were, to become gospel presenters. And they, and of course you all know the story. We'll come to it in a minute. But Jesus, Jesus knew exactly what to say to that woman to, to lead her to a path where she opened her heart to him. Could the Holy Spirit have given the disciples words to speak to do that? Please say yes. So they walked right past this woman. I wonder, folks, how many times every day I walk right past somebody that God would like me to speak to and I'm not listening. I, I, I don't want that. I want to learn to speak when he wants me to speak. I know you do too, amen. amen. They walked right past this woman. It's amazing to me to think about this and how many times I know I must walk right past somebody. And the angels longing for me to stop and speak a word in season. But now she arrives at the well. And she sees, she instantly recognizes Jesus as a Jew. From his dress, probably from his beard. And uh, avoids eye contact. Very interesting. You, can, you see the artist paintings of Jesus sitting there. And she walks up and doesn't even look at him. Um, and then there's this, I don't want to call it a technique, there's this opportunity that you and I have. One of the things that we can do to make contact with people is to ask a favor. You ever thought of that? Could you help me for a second? Um, and she's shocked. She says, you're a Jew talking to a Samaritan? <clears throat> By the way, did I tell you? Oh, yes, I told you that their temple was destroyed by a Jewish priest. He, he led a small army up there and destroyed it. And by the way, the, the stones from that temple have been made into an edifice up there on that mountain today. Um, those things have all been, you know, excavated and so forth. And she, and, and, and so when, when, when Jesus says to her, um, if you knew who asked you for water, you would have asked him for water. <laughs> and she said, huh? You don't have anything to draw water with. Apparently, friends, there was no rope there. You brought your own rope with your bucket. And then I love his answer. Look at it with me. By the way, uh, verse 12, the woman says, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Jesus says to her, uh, not only would he give you water, he would give you what kind of water? Living water. She had no idea what that meant. So she's still thinking of physical water, verse 11. You don't have anything to draw with. What do you get, what, where are you going to get some living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well, and who drank here, and his children, and his cattle? And Jesus said, whoever drinks of this water will, will be thirsty again. But when, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, understand. But when you drink of the water that I give, <laughs> it springs up into an everlasting fountain inside of you. She, of course, doesn't understand. Uh, but she, what does she think? She thinks literally, doesn't she? Uh, give me some water so I won't have to come here. It's interesting to me, folks, that Jesus has already, watch this interesting point. Jesus has already gained her confidence so that she actually believes she, she this is the Holy Spirit, folks, which want, who wants to do this in you and me. She actually believes that there's something that this man can give her so she won't be thirsty again. That's how quickly 
the Holy Spirit was able to give this woman confidence in who this man was. Jesus says, well, whoever drinks this water will not thirst again. The woman said, Give, let me have some, verse 15. Then verse 16. Uh, get your husband and, and come back for this water, in other words. And she said, well, I don't have a husband. You all know this story. And Jesus says, yes, I know. You've had five. And the one you have now isn't your husband. You're speaking the truth on that. Can you imagine putting yourself in this woman's place? It's like somebody is reaching into your heart and plucking the strings that nobody is supposed to know about. She says, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Now notice how she tries to avoid. And you and I meet this. You say something to somebody where you're trying to open a door to talk about spiritual things and they are not interested and so they maybe try to, try to sidetrack. Notice what she does. Of course, she's embarrassed. She says, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. What's she referring to? Gerizim. Um, right there to the south where you could still see the ruins of the temple. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men should worship. Do you understand the idea here? <clears throat> then Jesus says, Believe me, woman, the hour is coming when you will neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship you know not what. In other words, folks, this is the situation for most people that we meet, even Christians. I say this kindly. I'm, there may be Christians listening that um, would misunderstand if you didn't take a moment to think about this. Um, most Christians today, friends, do not understand the stakes of the time in which we live. Is that fair enough? And Jesus is saying kindly, and somehow God will help you and me say kindly to people, what you worship is a misunderstanding. Verse 23, but the hour is coming and is actually here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit. There's a whole sermon, folks, in that to worship. What does it mean to worship in spirit? I'm tempted to take a moment and pass a mic around. What, what are the facets that constitute worship in spirit? Surrendered heart? a determined interest, a willingness, a willingness to hear, a willingness to go, a willingness to do. I would imagine that most of us in this room have besetting sins that we hate, but we still do once in a while. Is that fair enough? I think I have found in myself that I, that I, that I see that I don't want that, but there's still a little tug there. Would that make any sense to you? I don't see too many heads nodding. I think worshiping in spirit is being willing to finally just cut that thing completely off, period. And say, and I, I'll tell you, I often say this to the Lord, folks. Lord, I don't want that. Because you know what happens? You've had this, don't you? Even if you say that, if you do that, does the desire come back sometime? What's my work then? 
same prayer. Lord, I don't want that. Even though there is in me the desire to want it, correct? And in my prayer, I'm, I'm, I'm saying the truth. I don't want it, but I'm also asking God to take the desire away. Amen? I think this is part of what it means to worship in spirit. And in truth, it's kind of the same thing, isn't it? Being truthful. So he's trying to help this woman. Verse 24, in spirit and in truth. Now Ellen White makes a very interesting comment about verse 25. She says, and this is so precious and interesting, as filled with iniquity's life as this woman was, She was a student. You read it. You, get, you, you look in Desire of Ages. She was a student of the Old Testament and had recognized that there was to be a Christ who would come. She actually was under the sense that this Christ would come in her day and that she would see him. Amazing. Isn't it precious, friends, how God keeps speaking to people even when they're living lives of sin, as she was? Verse 25, I know that the Messiah is coming, and his name is what? Are you reading there with me? What's his name? Christ. And when he has come, he will tell us everything. Now, this is amazing, folks. I don't think you'll find this anywhere else in the stories. Jesus says to her, I, I, I'm, I'm he. Isn't that amazing? I'll tell you, folks, when you, when you and I see people, maybe even, maybe even people in our own church that are really having problems with, you know, sin, um, you know this. We need to be so gracious and so forgiving without even being asked. That woman was in a mess, but in her heart, she knew that Christ was coming and she actually thought she would see him. It's amazing. And so Jesus could say, this is amazing, folks. He says, I'm the one. Did she believe it? Yeah. Yes, she did. <clears throat> Again, I want you to be thinking along the lines. What about you and me? Uh, and, and Jesus' effort to make, to help the disciples. You know, folks, this is so amazing. It took years for the disciples. This is amazing. It only took a few minutes for this woman. So maybe we need to be more quickly to become minute men <laughs> uh, like she was. Verse 27. Upon this came the disciples and they could, I'm paraphrasing, they couldn't believe that he was talking with this woman. But they didn't dare say anything. Like, why are you talking with her? There's a, there's a, whole, there's, there's a whole issue to look at there. Uh, we think that the Jewish people had these strong uh, um, inclinations to marginalize people because they weren't Jews or for whatever reason. Uh, and that's why, that's why the disciples said this in their minds. Um, we might be guilty of that at times as well. As I say, I want to look at this whole thing, Lord. What parts of this will help me, will, will make it more possible for you to help me to be effective in the work every one of us in this room longs to do? So the woman at that moment leaves. 
I've always uh, been interested in how she leaves and leaves her water pot. Her agenda, friends, listen to this. Her agenda was completely changed after a five-minute encounter with Christ. She left her water pot. Now, I'm going to stop for a minute as she's going to the city and look with you for a moment at the disciples. Um, in the meanwhile, verse 31, the disciples said, Master, here's the food. And notice this amazing verse, friends. He said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know of. So the disciples said, did somebody else bring him something? Uh, again, if you'd like to look at Desire of Ages, it's obvious from the text here, but Ellen White, by inspiration, and I know you love this, I just, by inspiration, she is given uh, insights that there isn't room in the scriptures for. She says that Jesus was no longer hungry, and he was no longer tired. Amen? Uh, you can all relate to that. I, I'm going to quickly tell you a story. Um, when I was working in the Nevada-Utah conference uh, with the pastors, uh, there was a pastor that was getting into trouble in his church in Salt Lake because he, was, he kept pushing in the liberal world, especially with music. And... Uh, so I went to meet with the board on Friday evening. We started the meeting before sundown and didn't end until midnight, struggling with their struggles. And the next morning after church, we had a business meeting. I stayed in a, in a little motel that night. Um, th there was a little breakfast available. There was very little that I could eat. Uh, there was no fellowship meal after the church service. I, the, the business meeting, which I chaired, lasted until almost sundown. It was like 5 o'clock before we finally came to some uh, proposed solution with the problem that because the church was being split. Some of the people liked the jazzy music. And, and a lot of the people, this was a Hispanic church, were very bothered. They could see where this was going. And most all of you can surely connect with that in view of what's happening today. And the pastor's wife, bless her heart, I was just leaving to go to the airport, brought me two little buns. And uh, there was a slice and something in the bun, I don't remember, just a little spread in there, whatever. And uh, I got on a plane, ended up in Las Vegas, where you, you can't get to Reno from Las Vegas, from uh, Salt Lake unless you go through Las Vegas. And it's about, by that time it's late, 10 o'clock. Um, most of the passengers were gone. There was only three or four people sitting in the waiting area for that particular gate. And there was a food place over there, and I, was really, really hungry. And um, I hadn't had any supper uh, when I got to Salt Lake. And then I did have that little bit of a breakfast and then those two buns. And so I actually decided to go buy something because there was nothing there you could that was appropriate, if you will. I actually had decided to go get something that um, was bad for you. But it was food hoping that there was nobody around that knew who I was. <laughs> because I wasn't only the ministerial secretary, I was the health ministries director for the conference. <clears throat> so I got in line. There's a lady in front of me. There's only five or six people at the most. And pretty quick there was a big space between her and the next person. And so I sort of stepped to the side a bit and I said, are you, are you going to be in line? And she said, uh, I'm trying to decide what to eat. 
And I said, me too. And we fell into conversation. And I found out she was a physician. And um, that's interesting to me, as most of you would know. Uh, asked her where she lived, Seattle. Oh, I said, we used to live in Seattle. We worked there for 12 years. And uh, we talked for several minutes about her. And I was asking her questions about what line of medicine she was in and so forth. And pretty soon she said, so what do you do? I could have honestly given several answers, but because of what she was, I said, well, I traveled the country and overseas lecturing on how people can get over diabetes. She said, huh, what do you tell them? I said, um, <clears throat> well, we tell them that the thing they should do is be on a whole plant regimen. And she said, uh, what did they do for satiety? Now, do you know what that fancy word means? Satisfied after the meal and not hungry. That's what that means. And uh, I'm sorry, I'll take a little side trip here just to, just to make sure you get what's going on here. <clears throat> uh, normally, in the, the normal American is satisfied from hunger because of their high-fat diet. You can only empty fat out of your stomach at the rate of 12 grams an hour. So a high-fat meal hangs around for a long time, which turns out is bad for you. You know that probably. But anyway, that's what's going on. So this physician knew something about that. And uh, um, so she knew, also she knew enough to know that a whole plant regimen is low in what? Fat. And you probably know that fat has more than twice as many calories as anything else. And there's only two other things, but nevertheless, twice as many calories. So I said to her, it's the fiber. She must have looked at me for 10 seconds and finally said, oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, we had a really nice visit. And uh, you know what, folks? I was no longer hungry. I'm serious. I'm not being cute. I was not hungry. And I turned my back on that food court and walked over to here, over here where uh, people, just two or three people were waiting for the flight that I was going to be on. And um, in my mind, I'm saying to the Lord, is there somebody here, Lord? I need to do that more, folks. I want you to do that too with me all the time, constantly saying, Lord, is there anybody here? And uh, I just, my eyes just fell on, actually, her back. There was a young woman sitting there and a couple of other people. I don't even remember now who, who they were. I was just impressed. Of course, I wouldn't sit by her, but I went over and sat maybe eight seats away from her. And as I sat down, she looked up. And I was kind of watching to see if there would be some response. And... Um, I, so I said to her, um, so is Reno home for you? That's where the flight was going. And she said, yes. And we fell into conversation. And it turns out her husband was a pastor. <laughs> Do you think this is an accident? And we had the nicest conversation. I, I was telling her how thankful I was that her husband had that work and and uh, we, I, I, I finally asked her, could you give me your phone number or something? I want to come hear your husband preach. So we had a wonderful conversation. And uh, folks, you know this feeling. My, well, how can I describe it? I just felt like I was walking on air. Amen? And now I'm getting on the airplane. There's only about five people on the plane. And you know... On Southwest, you sit wherever you want. I, this is crazy what I did. It's just insane. I'm walking around the corner, and there's the aisle, and I'm saying, Lord, is there someone here? And 
my eyes fall on this older, not older, but kind of older woman sitting on the aisle about 10 rows back. This is insane, folks. Neva, come over here and sit, would you, just for a second, real quick. <clears throat> this whole plane is empty. And I come and I do this, you know, <laughs> sit by the window. And I said something to her as I did that. I'll, I'll make this story short. Uh, we fell into conversation. And uh, I learned something from an atheist one time on an airplane. Um, Neve and I were traveling somewhere overseas. And we overheard this man. Uh, and I learned he was an atheist later. Say something like, if you want to start a conversation with somebody you're sitting near, you need to start it sooner rather than later. So as soon as you sit down, you say something, or as soon as you possibly can. And um, so I said something to her, apologizing. But Lord, folks, it turns out this woman was an assemblyman. Now, in, in, in the state of Nevada, the house that's called the assembly, they still call even the men and the women, they're all assemblymen. And um, we just, and, and it turns out this woman had diabetes. So we have this conversation that lasted an hour from the time that we got on the plane. And, I, and in that time, I got to know something about her husband. When we got off the plane, I met him. I got her phone number. And anyway, I, folks, I wasn't tired or hungry at all. Are you all with me? That's Jesus. He said to the disciples, I have food. Listen, now, this is, this is not cute, folks. He says, I have food you don't know about. Are you with me, friends? We need to learn about this food. Amen? I want to learn more about it. I know that you do. My prayer this morning has been all week as I've been thinking about this. You all know this, and I'm just as ineffective as you are. I'm not a very effective evangelist. You and I work hard, and we don't often get people to give their hearts to Jesus. Is that fair enough? And sometimes we're discouraged about that. Is that correct? But I want us to never give up and to keep cooperating. Folks, I'll tell you what. If there is some large or tiny sin in my life or yours, you know this. It is a problem for the Lord to use me like he would like to. Amen? But Jesus wasn't referring to the sin in the disciples' lives. He just wanted them to understand. Now, not, let's notice here, um, the disciples in verse 33, I said, it meant this, did somebody bring him some food? And Jesus said, my food is to do his will. And to do what else? Finish the work. And then he said to them, with his generous kindness and forgiving spirit, wouldn't you say it's about four months until the harvest? And I suppose they looked up and saw the little green shoots, like the Palouse right now, right? The little green shoots. Uh, a little, little later than now. And they said, yeah, I suppose, four months. He says, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are already white. And Ellen White says that as Jesus said that, let me back up an inch, the woman goes to the city, this profligate, friends. Jesus can make an evangelist out of a profligate, is that right? And you may have, and I may have sins in, in our lives that we're battling with. I know you know this. Jesus loves to forgive. And he is ready to take any of us. You say to yourself, oh, it can't be. I, I don't, don't do that, folks. Let us, let us accept the fact that Jesus wants to use us powerfully to touch other people's lives. She goes to the city, 
this profligate, this despised woman, and says, come see a man that told me everything I ever did. Did Jesus tell her everything she ever did? Why did she say that? Because she knew that he knew. And the, and the Bible says this, and Ellen White talks about this. And, and she says, is not, actually she uses the word Messiah and Christ. She says, is not this the Christ? Is not this the Messiah? And because God was able to speak through this woman, those people believed her. Is that correct? And the Bible says the whole city came out. And here's what Ellen White talks about. She says, as Jesus said this, the people were leaving the city. They weren't coming on the pathway. They were leaving the city and their white tunics, as they, as they poured out of the town, turned the little green grass to what? White, white already to harvest. <laughs> and they begged him to come and talk to them, and he stayed there for several days. What a story. What a story for you and me. Lord, help me. Help me to learn from the situation of the poor disciples and how gracious Jesus, I, I am so thankful folks that Jesus is gracious with me and as you know he is gracious with all of us happy to forgive us, longs to give us victory and longs to use us as he did this woman let's pray Father, I think I speak for every one of us. We want to be your workers. We want to be filled with your presence. We want to have some of this food, Lord, that the disciples didn't know about. So bless us. Bless this congregation. Lord, this congregation is poised to make some advancements that we have longed for. You have arranged circumstances in the world, in this country, where people are hungering for something they know not of. And you've brought us a pastor who clearly has been blessed as a young man with insights far beyond his age. He has promised us that every time he's here, he's going to call us to respond and to become workers. Lord, bless every one of us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now as you sing this closing,